Okay, let's uh, get our meeting started. Uh, welcome to the North Jersey Astronomical Group. Uh, my name is Kevin Karan. I'm the president of the, uh, of the club. And uh, welcome to our December meeting, our final meeting of the year. Uh, I don't really know how that happened. Where, where did the time go? Uh, we're here at the end of the, end of the year, uh, finishing up another orbit of uh, planet Earth here. Uh, it's almost time for the solstice and, and uh, we start another cycle. And uh, so uh, we're gonna get our meeting started tonight uh, with a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, we have with us uh, John S uh, Sitchell from the Amateur Astronomers Incorporated down in Cranford. And um, he's going to talk a little bit about animal astronomers. You might think that's an odd title, but uh, he's going to talk about uh, how animals use the sky, and birds navigating and things like that. And so it's a really interesting topic. And so uh, let's uh, turn it over to, uh, to John. Go ahead, John. Thank you, Kevin. Um, this topic was suggested to me several years ago by the membership chair at Amateur Astronomers Incorporated, who uh, like me is a birder. And I, I confess I didn't take it too seriously at first, but the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. And here's why. Uh, astronomy, human astronomy, as we think about it today is kind of an abstract field. It appeals to everyone, but to most people, its appeal lies in its abstraction. It lies in the beauty of the night sky and the, the coolness of the optical equipment and in the pursuit of knowledge uh, of, of, of distant things like exoplanets and cosmology and black holes and dark matter and dark energy and gravitational waves and all that stuff. And we can either, all those are all things we can either do nothing about or that have little direct effects on our lives other than making us marvel and spend lots of money on equipment. Um, what we tend to forget in this over, overlit, infinitesimally clocked, computerized world is that astronomy was and still is a subject with direct impact on our everyday lives. How do you find your way in the woods or at sea? Um, when do we look for certain foods in the wild or plant crops or expect the Nile to flood? Uh, when are the tides going to be especially high? What's the size and shape of the world? astronomical knowledge was vital to the survival of our ancestors. And it's just possible that attention to and interest in the phenomenon of the, of the heavens is an evolved trait. Um, which brings us to today's topic. Are we unique in our pursuit of astronomy or is this just another empty boast of our egocentric species? Um, the answer of course, or I wouldn't be sitting here, is that our fellow species depend on astronomical phenomena as much as we do and show some remarkable astronomical skills. Um, let me start off by throwing, uh, well, let me start off by changing my slide. Um, where'd the little thing go, hold on. Um, there we go, sorry. Um, let me start off by throwing a little cold water on the subject. As far as I know, um, no fruit bat, earthworm, rotifer, cassowary, or armadillo uh, has ever written a peer-reviewed paper on, say, low and high Z, highly accreting quasars in the 4D eigenvector one context, um, to pick a subject at random. Uh, on the other hand, none of those creatures watch reality TV either, uh, or seem to mistake it for reality. So who is smarter than whom, I don't really know. Uh, and no, wolves don't actually howl at the moon. They howl at night because they're largely nocturnal. Um, although that of course is in itself astronomical behavior. And they point their snouts up in the air when they howl so their voices will carry. Um, so they aren't interested in the age of the 
uh, of the crater Tycho or the amount of water present on the moon. It's our fascination with the moon and with wolves, uh, I might add, that cause us to conflate those two phenomena. Um, but birds, on the other hand, um, tend to be consummate astronomers. Uh, I wish I could say, by the way, for those of you I was talking to earlier that I took this picture, but no. <laughs> um, uh, I have not ever gotten this close to this magnificent little bird, which is called an Arctic tern. Um, true to their name, Arctic terns nest in the Arctic. Um, it's a very good strategy when you're raising young because there's an abundance of food and a dearth of competition. The problem, of course, is that other than the two or so months of summer, it's very cold and any animal that depends on diving from about 25 feet up into the water for food is going to have a hard time with ice. Uh, so Arctic terns migrate. They, they really, really migrate. Um, they winter in the waters off Antarctica, where of course it's summer when they're there, so they don't see the stars much. There's a wonderful book about Arctic terns by the author John Hay called Bird of Light, which is a perfect title because it doesn't really see much dark. Uh, and they don't fly straight either. They tend to zig and zag with prevailing winds and handy food sources. Uh, uh, when the Arctic summer ends, they zig and zag their way back north. Excuse me, when the Antarctic summer ends, they zig and zag their way back north to, the, uh, to their yearly nesting grounds. Therefore, in a year, they travel over 24,000 miles. Uh, they can live a fairly long time. In, in, in John Hay's book that I just mentioned, he cites the example of an Arctic tern that was found uh, dead by naturalists and the bird had been banded um, by an ornithologist 34 years earlier. So the bird was at least 34 years old and it was a female. And if you think about it, in that 34 year lifespan, she probably laid between 50 or 60 eggs struggling every year to feed and protect her chicks. She'd flown the circumference of the earth 34 times, uh, more than enough to go to the moon and back, uh, or almost enough to go to the moon and back, more than enough to go to the moon, uh, and weighed, as is more or less typical for her species, a grand total of four ounces. So um, that's a tough bird, right? And a life well lived. Um, and this turn and every turn likes, like her makes that epic yearly migration and returns to the nesting colony where they were born. How on earth does a four ounce creature manage that feat of navigation? And the answer, not surprisingly, is through astronomy. Um, but before I give you that answer, let's examine one other prodigious migrant. This is a black bellied plover, uh, or if you're from Europe, it's called a gray plover. The Europeans name it after their their basic plumage, and we name it after their breeding plumage. Um, it's a relative of the, the killdeers, which nest uh, in the parking lot of Sperry Observatory uh, every year, uh, and probably somewhere near you too. Um, you could probably find a couple of them tomorrow if you wanted to at, uh, at Island Beach State Park or Barnegat Light or Cape May or a lot of other spots along the shore as well. Um, they won't look like the, as I mentioned, like the handsome bird on the left, because now they're in their basic plumage. Um, and uh, that's the way they are from, from basically uh, from early fall through late spring. Um, and you can see from the map in the middle picture, they nest on the north slope of Alaska and in the Canadian Arctic, where the dark colors are. And you can see where they winter. There are some that winter along our shores, but some of them winter all the way south to Uruguay and, and Chile there. Um, and uh, like the terns and many other birds, uh, they don't find their way vaguely north. They return to the exact breeding ground where they were born year after year. Um, plovers, like many other shorebirds, add one more amazing feat to their migratory habits after raising their chicks to a certain point of readiness, the parents just leave and take off for points south. The chicks hang around for a while, putting on weight. Um, and um, you know, then they know instinctively that they too have to leave. They know what to do, where to go, and how to get back. If you're a birder uh, in New Jersey, you know that the fall shorebird migration comes in two waves. As early as mid-July, the adults are coming through and then about a month of a month later, the the youngins appear on their way to, uh, on their way south. 
it amazes me that these first year plumbers and sandpipers are able to do what they do. Um, while my kids were growing up, I tried to apply plover child rearing techniques in my family and it, it, uh, it just didn't seem to work. Um, the, the, uh, although I, I was sometimes tempted to head south without you know, leaving a forwarding address and let them figure it out. But, but anyway, how, how do they find their way uh, south? It turns out that ethologists who are animal behaviorists um, uh, have done some experiments to figure this out. A series of German experiments about 55 years ago or so showed that birds use the position of the sun to orient themselves southward. They know some basic astronomy that a lot of people today have forgotten, uh, which is the further north you go, the lower the sun is in the sky. So if you're far north, then the sun rises in the southeast and southwest, and all you have to do is fly towards the center of its path. Uh, further, birds use their circadian rhythm, their sense of time, to know that they have to steer west of the sun in the morning and east of the sun in the evening. Uh, this was shown by placing captive birds in an indoor environment with an artificial light source. When this ersat sun was made to move, uh, move west to east, or in other patterns only conceivable to, <laughs> to uh, German scientists, the birds flew in the wrong directions. Um, the birds have a sense of how high the sun should be at the zenith for their breeding and wintering grounds. They know it rises in the east and sets in the west. They do basic astronomy. But what about birds that migrate at night? Um, you may think, if you've forgotten the first slide, how many birds actually migrate at night? Well, the answer to that lies in the fact that hawks and falcons migrate during the day. So there are a lot of birds which for some strange reason um, are averse to sharing the sky with hawks and falcons. So many other migratory birds do migrate at night. In fact, most of them do, especially if you count by species. Um, songbirds like these red-winged blackbirds here uh, migrate at night, by the way, just so you know, Red-winged blackbirds are highly dimorphic, so what look like two different kinds of birds in this are just the males and the females. Males here and females here. There's a younger male with yellower wings and so on. Um, so um, songbirds are the largest order of birds, uh, both by the number of species and individual numbers. And they're a group of birds with feet specialized for perching. You can see looking at this house wren, He's not clenching that. That's the natural, like relaxed position of his foot. He has to exert himself to unclench. Um, and um, they, they have special supercharged vocal hardware and software uh, in their throats and uh, not their throats, actually in their bronchial tubes and their brains. Um, and the four birds shown here are all migratory songbirds that are common in New Jersey. Um, at the top, we have a, a black and white warbler and the brown creeper. And on the bottom, you have a house wren and a tree swallow. Um, uh, the creeper is a bird which nests mostly in points north. This is the brown creeper here. Uh, and, um, and may spend the winter in your backyard if you have enough trees there. Uh, by contrast, the other three birds um, winter in the south and return to the garden state to breed. They all migrate at night. And how do they do that? The answer, again, not surprisingly, is astronomy. They steer by the stars. Um, it was long assumed that that's what birds did. And those same German scientists who determined 50 years ago that birds are sensitive to the angle of the sun showed in a series of very elegant experiments that birds are not particularly sensitive to constellations. What they understand is the circling of the sky around Polaris. Uh, just like in this picture of star trails. So birds were in it, they were kept in an enclosed space and shown a planetarium scene of the night sky. If the sky didn't move, the birds flew in random directions. If the sky moved in the proper way, then the birds flew south, that is to say directly away from Polaris. When the sky was rotated around Betelgeuse, the birds flew in the wrong direction. Um, so birds understand the rotation of the earth and the consequent circumpolar motion of the stars, which is pretty swift. Um, but what do they do if it's cloudy or raining when it's time to pack up uh, and fly away? Or simply, what do they, uh, what if they do if they're migrating through New Jersey where you can never see the stars, right? Um, 
on days with low visibility, then birds find their way by using the Earth's magnetic field. Um, due to the convection of heat in its liquid core, as you all know, the Earth, uh, the, the heat is generated by, by uh, radioactive decay. Combined with rotation, the Earth generates a pretty powerful magnetic field that creates lines of force in this toroidal pattern uh, flowing from south, the South Pole to the North. Birds are able to sense this and then follow it north and south. And they have a surprising adaptation um, that helps them to sense the magnetic field. Neurons in the ears of birds contain microscopic globules of iron. Um, iron, of course, is highly magnetic. Uh, as you know, if you've ever played with a hairy harry, I think they were called, um, these globules probably help birds find their way south. Almost every bird species examined has these uh, iron globules in their auditory neurons. We do not and um, are not nearly so good at sensing the Earth's magnetic field. Um, as it says here, maybe that explains why we can't ask for directions when we're lost, right? Um, other animals fly south as well. Some species of bats do. Uh, some people from the Northeast fly south every winter, but uh, rely on technology to do it. And very famously, North America's monarch butterflies fly south. Monarchs are widespread, by the way, and not all populations migrate. Um, and of course, they're all threatened, just like almost everything else in this, in this, uh, in this uh, talk. Uh, any birder who's ever visited a hawk watch uh, site in September or October has experienced the, the sensation of looking up excitedly at what looks like a really big bird very high up only to find out it's a very small insect about 20 feet over your head, um, uh, which is what the monarchs are. But any disappointment is always tempered with admiration for these like weightless little bits of powder and ick, <laughs> um, which is a pretty good description of most insects that have almost no brain and yet brave very difficult conditions to launch themselves toward a destination they've never seen. Only every fourth generation or so of monarch butterflies makes this epic voyage. Their lifespan is short enough so that several generations will pass in a single summer. So the late summer migrants who will hibernate through the winter and then return north to lay their eggs don't even have the benefit of learning from their parents. Um, but they still make a trip of as much as 4,000 miles to their wintering grounds in Mexico. And how do they find, uh, how do they find their way? They don't even rise to the level of bird brain. Um, and actually some birds have very large brains. That's a, that's a calumny. Uh, the question uh, has been extensively researched. Uh, this is a picture of a butterfly that's been tagged for research purposes. Um, and the answer seems to be that like birds, monarchs use both the earth's magnetic field and the position of the sun to migrate. So even these little bits of fluff have uh, instinctive knowledge of some astronomical phenomenon, as do what I consider to be um, the coolest and most noble of insects, dragonflies. Um, many species of dragonflies also migrate. Some, like this green darner, that's clearly the one on the left, um, migrate only one way. One generation goes south and breeds a new generation, which then migrates north, and so on. Others, like this variegated meadowhawk, is the name of that species, uh, make the traditional round trip once in their lifetimes. Like monarch butterflies, dragonflies are daytime migrates, migrants, excuse me, uh, but they differ in a significant way. Monarch butterflies are toxic and birds, for the most part, leave them alone. Dragonflies, on the other hand, uh, even though they're very fierce predators, they're also very tasty, at least to birds. And it's a pretty common thing at hawk watch sites to see broad-winged hawks or kestrels or merlins, catching them in the midair in mid and then just eating them uh, on the wing. Um, just another reason in a way to uh, admire their steadfastness and bravery. Um, and not all migration occurs in the sky, uh, of course. A number of ocean-going organisms migrate as well, including whales, salmon, and many other fish, and sea turtles. This is the loggerhead sea turtle, which has the longest migration route of any sea turtle, about 10,000 miles. They're born in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, 
migrate to feeding areas off the coast of Africa and return to their breeding beaches to lay their eggs. Again, they come back to the beach where they were born. This practice of coming back precisely to your home to breed is called natal phylopatry. Um, and uh, mitochondrial DNA analysis of sea turtles has confirmed that this is what they do. Um, so turtle navigation begins at birth as soon as the hatchlings dig their way out of the nest. They have to find their way to the water, which is a famously dangerous journey that only a few of them survive. To find the ocean, they use astronomy naturally. They orient themselves towards the reflection of moonlight off the water. So maybe they're the primordial example of a Newtonian reflector. Um, they also share with modern astronomers an aversion to artif artificial light. Only in their case, the situation is much more grave. Artificially lit beaches cause turtle hatchlings to go completely awry and result in mass mortality. Once they reach the water, they steer with the currents and face the challenge of orienting themselves underwater in the open oceans. Evidence suggests they use the Earth's magnetic fields as birds and butterflies do, but their navigational feats are even more remarkable. Um, Darwin commented on the amazing accuracy of turtle migration, writing about green sea turtles, which migrate from offshore Brazil to Ascension Island, a 1400 uh, mile journey to an island uh, about 12 miles in diameter. He said, even if we grant animals a sense of the points of the compass, how can we account for green sea turtles finding their way to that speck of land in the midst of the great Atlantic Ocean? a few degrees off and the turtle would miss her island by 60 to 75 miles. Uh, turtles also use their magnetic compass to, and by the way, before I keep going, many of them do miss, right? If, you, if you're a birder, you're used to finding birds way off course in places. So it's just the vast majority of them that are able to use astronomy to find their way. Uh, and presumably it's the same with the turtles. They also use their magnetic compass to stay within the warm water patterns they need for feeding and well-being. They seem to instinctively reorient themselves when they approach the borders of warm water corridors in which they swim. This has been observed in hatchling turtles, so the ability seems to be instinctive. Um, and as far as whales are concerned, uh, by the way, they follow a variety of migratory plans. Some, like humpback whales, travel regular routes between feeding and calving grounds. Others, like sperm whales, seem to wander more or less randomly. We don't know much about how they navigate. It's pretty hard to experiment on a whale. Um, you can't put it in a small room with a planetarium simulation. Uh, but we do know they travel immensely long distances. Some sperm whales may travel up to 24,000 miles in their lifetime. That may be nothing compared to an Arctic tern, which weighs about, I did the math, about one half millionth as much and lives about half the lifespan, but it's still a pretty impressive feat. Um, not all navigation, as it says here, is done by sight. Magnetic compasses are also known to exist in some land animals. This is a blind mole rat, um, not to be confused with the naked mole rat, which is even weirder looking, um, but it's a rodent that lives underground in vast burrow complexes uh, from which it never emerges. Most blind mole rat burrows contain no exits to the ground, uh, to the ground above, um, so they never come out under the stars. They're more like professional astronomers than amateur astronomers, I guess, in that way. Uh, and in fact, they are completely blind which is not like astronomers, but they nevertheless use the astronomical phenomenon of the Earth's magnetic field to find their way around their, their subterranean complexes. Uh, blind mole rats are heavily researched animals, not least because they, they seem to have a, a natural resistance to many cancers. So experiments have verified their use of internal magnetic compasses. Um, and not all migration is, hor is horizontal either. Um, uh, and it's not all done over a span of months. The zooplankton community in our oceans migrates daily from the depths to the surface. The obvious astronomical factor here is the Earth's rotation, which is to say when the sun is out. During the day, the tiny organisms and larvae that make up the zooplankton community go into the depths, presumably to avoid predation or the harmful effects of the sun's UV radiation. At night, they rise to the surface to feed on phytoplankton, tiny plants in the plankton community, 
uh, and they perform an important ecological service since they transport nutrients down into the depths of the ocean. Their waste falls to the bottom, uh, sometimes called marine snow, and that forms the base of the oceans, uh, the deep ocean food chain. Their daily migration hastens the descent of this marine snow by as much as days. Um, so far, all the animal astronomers we've looked at use the heavens for purposes of migration, uh, of getting from one place to another. But there's another ancient imperative, which for some animals involves a bit of astronomy. Um, that is reproduction, of course. On the Pacific coast, at certain times, millions of small fish called grunion um, cast themselves up on the beach to mate and lay their eggs. Seems like strange behavior for a fish, um, but we have something analogous here in New Jersey uh, along the Delaware Bay shore, where at certain times in May and June, horseshoe crabs, which aren't really crabs and don't really look like horseshoes as far as I'm concerned, but um, they crawl out of the water to mate and lay their eggs. Um, just as a digression here, you probably know horseshoe crabs are a, a very ancient order of arthropods uh, who are the closest living relative to the signature animal of the Paleozoic era, the trilobite, um, of which there were hundreds or even maybe millions of species, um, or thousands <laughs> for that matter. Horseshoe crabs can see in the ultraviolet as well as visual ranges, so their view of the night sky would be an interesting one. Uh, and trilobites are only are one of the only life forms known to have had lenses, as do uh, lenses uh, for their eyes that are made out of calcite, a mineral that is common in the exoskeletons of arthropods. If you've read uh, Thomas Pynchon's enormous and very insane novel called Against the Day, you know that calcite, at least in some of its forms, like Iceland spar, has the property of double refraction. Um, so you have to wonder what the night sky would have looked like to trilobites. Um, uh, but the important question here is why do these grunion and horseshoe crabs, which are completely aquatic otherwise, want to lay their eggs on the beach? And what does astronomy have to do with it? Well, as far as the first part of the question is concerned, the sea is filled with predators. By comparison, the beach is a day at the beach. Uh, so these animals lay their eggs in the sand and they don't want the eggs to be washed back into the sea by the next wave uh, or to become, uh, just so they could become, you know, an omelet for some uh, small uh, fish fry or copepod. But on the other hand, their offspring don't breathe air, so they need to be able to get back to the water once they're hatched. So there needs to be a kind of Goldilocks zone where the grunion and horseshoe crabs can climb out onto the sand and lay their eggs that will be safe until the hatchlings come out at which point it will be maximally easy for them to get back to the water quickly. So horseshoe crabs and grunion depend on the tides, which are of course an astronomical phenomenon. They're caused by the gravity of the moon and to a lesser extent, the gravity of the sun. Uh, and when the moon is new or full, uh, it's in line with the sun and the tidal effects of the two are combined, producing unusually high tides called spring tides, um, which in the grand tradition of perfectly accurate naming don't only happen in spring, but uh, clearly uh, twice a month. Um, uh, so when the grunion and horseshoe crabs wait for the spring tide to storm, uh, excuse me, so that's what they do. They wait for the spring tide to storm the beaches. Uh, then the eggs are safe relatively, uh, wait for the next slide on that, until the next spring tide, whereupon they hatch and the hatchlings wriggle out of the sand just in time to be washed back into the sea. It's a very nifty plan. Um, in the end, migration does come into, uh, into the story, much to the chagrin of the horseshoe crabs. Um, shorebirds, like the black-bellied plovers we met at the beginning of this presentation, time their northward migration to arrive at the Delaware Bay shore just in time for uh, a horseshoe crab egg feast. Um, to lay on fuel for the rest of their northwards journey. Three species in particular, uh, the sanderling, ruddy turnstone, and red knot, which are all in this picture in one place or another. The little flashes of black are ruddy turnstones because they're also red and these are red knots and the, the grayer ones are sanderlings. Um, they, they, uh, they in particular depend on it. The entire Western hemisphere population of red knots is thought to descend on Cape May every spring. And needless to say, 
uh, as we are wiping out the horseshoe crab population through habitat degradation, uh, that uh, very ancient species and all the birds that depend on it are threatened. The good news is that horseshoe crabs have some interesting uh, uh, characteristics, mainly their blood, that makes them vital to medical research. So uh, the pharmaceutical lobbyists are involved in conservation efforts, which means something may actually be done to protect that habitat. Um, so to sum up, the Earth's magnetic field and the apparent rotation of the stars and the position of the sun in the sky and the tides are all vital to the lives of animals as they are to us. And animals exploit them in a number of amazing ways. But surely there's a difference between animal astronomers and human ones, those scholarly articles, right? Um, and an appreciation of the aesthetic beauty of the night sky. Surely animals aren't interested in esoteric things like galaxies or cosmology, right? Well, mostly right. There's one fabulous, exotic, amazing creature that is absolutely responsive, excuse me, that is actually responsive to the structure of the Milky Way. Meet the dung beetle. Um, in case you're unfamiliar with dung beetles, they're named after what they eat. Uh, species are found all over the world and play a vital role in maintaining sanitary conditions, but they're most known from places where there's a community of large animals to produce maximal quantities of their favorite treat uh, like on the African savanna, for instance. Um, what typically happens when, let's say, an elephant does his or her business is that a crowd of dung beetles descend on the, on the all-you-can-eat buffet, uh, and they roll bits of dung into balls in which they lay their eggs, and then they bury, they bury those, those dung balls. There are lots of dung beetles, so the crowd around the buffet can get rather unruly, and temperature, uh, tempers can grow short. Some enterprising dung beetles may try to steal the hard-earned treasure of others. Therefore, what usually happens is that the dung beetle rolls his or her treasure away from ground zero as fast as he can to get away from the feeding frenzy. And they tend to follow light. So on dark nights, dung beetles have been observed using the Milky Way as their getaway routine. Uh, their getaway route, I should say. Dung beetles following the Milky Way. Imagine what would happen if there were more elephants in New Jersey. Uh, every street and walkway light would be a beacon to hordes of dung beetles trying to bury their treasures. It might actually get people to turn their lights out, uh, or maybe they might actually like the free fertilizer. Um, so, of course, there's a difference between astronomers and astronauts, as was made famous by the Jurassic Park movies. Um, and animals are not only involved with astronomy. Many of them have become astronauts, even if not by choice probably the most famous of them, and certainly heroine of one of the saddest stories, is this one, Laika, the first Earth organism to go into orbit. She was a stray dog from the Moscow streets and was selected to be sent into space aboard Sputnik 2 in 1957. At the time, no one knew much about conditions in space, and furthermore, no one knew how to get an orbiting spacecraft successfully down. So Laika was uh, being sent on what was essentially a, a, a suicide mission. And the public was told that she was remotely euthanized on the sixth day of the mission before her oxygen could run out. It was later learned, however, that Laika died from overheating just a few hours into the mission due to a failure of the R-7 rocket to, uh, to properly detach from the capsule. Her fate was cruel and very sad, but she and other luckier animals after her pave the way for human astronauts like this simulated mission crew here with my then 16-year-old uh, son in the pilot's chair. Um, and animals of many species have, have played an important role in teaching us how to cope with the challenges of space. When I took my son uh, down to the Space Academy in Huntsville a few, uh, several years ago, I toured the facilities a little and there were a lot of impressive things to see there but I'm not sure anything made as big an impression on me, of, on me as this little monument, um, which adds a shred of dignity to the outside of the gift shop. Um, it's a monument to the first animal to survive a NASA space flight, a squirrel monkey named Miss Baker. As you can probably guess, her less fortunate predecessor was named Alpha, uh, uh, or Abel, excuse me, and the succeeding monkey was named Charlie. Um, but as you can see from the dates here, Miss Baker survived her mission, right? She was born in 1957 and died in 1984 um, and uh, went 
on to a long and presumably luxurious, uh, well-earned retirement. This monument was put up after her death at the age of 27, which was a very advanced age for a squirrel monkey. And what's touching about this monument is the tradition of keeping Miss Baker's memory alive with ever replenished offerings of fresh bananas, which you can see piled on top there. Um, they were there when I visited, although they were a bit browner than the ones in this picture um, way back in 2013. If you've seen the right stuff, uh, you've seen an animal actor portray this animal astronaut um, over here. This is Ham, uh, who was used to test the mercury capsule before Scott Glenn, Fred Ward, and Ed Harris got to use it. Um, his dates correspond quite closely to Miss Baker's. He was born about a year before her and died about a year uh, before her as well. Ham was born in Cameroon and brought to this country, involuntarily, of course, as a baby. He was selected out of 40 candidates for his Mercury flight, which lasted about 17 minutes. Um, he played a much more active role in his mission than Miss Baker did. He was trained to complete some tasks that simulated things astronauts would have to do in space, pulling levers, pressing buttons, and so on. And he passed with flying colors, taking only a few seconds longer than he did when earthbound to complete his routine. He also contributed to the development of space flight in an involuntary way. His capsule suffered a partial pressure loss and Ham would surely have died were it not for the new technology he was trying out, uh, which was his pressure suit. And by the way, Ham's real name was not Ham. His handlers gave him an extremely politically incorrect name of Chop Chop Chang, uh, which really is a terrible name on a lot of levels. And NASA uh, officially referred to him as number 65. They didn't want him to have a name so that in case something uh, went wrong, it wouldn't be bad press. Um, they thought people would have less sympathy for him if he were just a number. After his landing, he was named for the place where he lived at Holloman Air Force Base. In true NASA fashion, HAM is an acronym for Holloman Aerospace Medical Center. Um, by the way, Ham died the year The Right Stuff came out in 1983. The movie paid tribute to the astronauts who died in Apollo 1 at the end, but there was no tribute to Ham and he, he deserved it. Um, these days, even though humans are spending months in space, animal astronauts are still accompanying them, including arthropods, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. These little guys are Japanese rice fish, also called madaka fish, which are found in fresh and brackish water. They're about an inch and a half long at the most. They're very hardy, they reproduce quickly and can withstand cold temperatures and have an additional virtue that makes them excellent for studying the effects of weightlessness on bone density. As you can see here, they're transparent. Uh, and since I know you're wondering about this, they have the distinction of being the first chordate animal to join the astronaut equivalent of the Mile High Club. Uh, having mated it spawned a healthy brood of small fry in 1994 aboard the Columbia. Uh, they traveled into space again in 2012, launching in a, in a Russian Soyuz capsule and taking up residence in an aquarium on the ISS. Um, spiders have also gone into space as early as 1973, and various species have been back many times. Um, you can probably see why people are interested in sending spiders uh, into space because they then get about constructing things once they're up there. Um, the pioneers were named Ariadne and Arabella, unsurprising names for spiders. Uh, and their mission was the brainchild of a then high school student named Judy Miles, who wondered whether they would be able to spin webs in a weightless environment. This is actually an interesting cognitive issue and NASA decided to make Judy's experiment a reality. The results were really interesting. Uh, the first picture on the left this one over here, sorry, having trouble, oh, let me go back, having trouble with the cursor. Um, the first picture on the left uh, is a web spun by Arabella on Earth. And then this picture over here is her first attempt uh, to spin a web in space. Uh, obviously, low G played havoc with her technique, but after the Skylab astronauts encouraged her to make a new web by tearing the first one down, she showed uh, in the third picture that, uh, that um, a complex three-dimensional geometric task could be mastered in low G, uh, at least if you happen to be a spider. And her sister Ariadne also mastered, uh, mastered the task 
um, her her web is right here. That's Ariadne. Um, and um, spiders can go a long time without food. And I don't know if Ariadne and Arabella got nice juicy flies for their efforts, but subsequent spider astronauts have been fed in space and have shown some interesting adaptations to weightlessness. Some of them ceased building webs altogether and just took to pouncing on their prey. Um, so the bird lover in me wants to know, what about birds? Um, in point of fact, birds have never been into space, although some pigeons have been passengers on the so-called vomit comet, the, uh, the plane that NASA uses to simulate weightlessness. Birds with their prodigious array of orienting techniques could theoretically learn to fly in a pressurized microgravity cabin, but there's a problem that has blocked any attempts to have, uh, to have them learn, namely that birds have always relied on gravity for purposes of sanitation, and the situation in an enclosed spacecraft could get really, really messy, uh, as you probably can imagine if you've ever parked your car under a bird-friendly tree. Um, that being said, there's a wonderful story by Arthur Clarke from the old, old days about a canary illegally brought up to a space station by a member of the crew. The canary eventually saves everyone's life by passing out when an air purifier uh, fails and the alarm doesn't work. I don't I think the story is called Feathered Friends. I'm not sure. Um, so, and here's the ultimate animal astronaut, which you uh, are all probably familiar with. Uh, this is a tardigrade, uh, sometimes called a moss bear or a water bear. Um, oops, let me go back to the tardigrade. Um, tardigrades are uh, an animal that was only discovered in the 18th century. So bizarre, it occupies its own phylum with about 1,200 known species and fossils dating back to the Cambrian period. They're very widespread. They favor mossy patches, and they're about half a millimeter in length, which means they're just barely visible. Um, the name means something like slow stepper, and you can see from just looking at the picture that it's a pretty apt name. They're not extremophiles like methane metabolizing bacteria uh, in that they do not thrive in extreme conditions, but, uh, they have a remarkable ability to survive in extreme conditions. They can be frozen right through or dried out for years and then be reconstituted in the proper conditions and step slowly off into the sunset as if nothing had happened. They can be irradiated at levels that would shame a cockroach. And here's the amazing part, they can survive in a vacuum. Uh, in fact, tardigrades are the first animals other, other than us to go EVA, and they've done it without a spacesuit. In 2007, a number of tardigrades were exposed to hard vacuum for 10 days. Upon being brought back out of the vacuum, 68% of them revived, wow. shook themselves off, and wandered off on their slow, merry way. Um, their subsequent mortality rate was high, but many produced viable offspring, which is pretty impressive for something that looks like a tiny little Klaus Oldenburg stat, uh, sculpture with legs. Um, so... Um, all of these animals were sent into space by humans, right? Well, probably. Uh, you've probably all heard of Alan Hill's 84001. Alan is a rock, uh, but a rock with a difference. Alan is from Mars. He was found in 1984 in the Alan Hills of Antarctica and weighed about four pounds. He's since been cut up into lots of little pieces. Um, according to Vicki Hamilton of the University of Hawaii, who based her 2005 findings on data from the Mars Global Surveyor and the Mars Odyssey spacecraft, Alan was likely born about 4.1 billion years ago in the Valles Marineris on Mars, uh, which, as you know, is a gigantic canyon that can be seen by Earthbound telescopes. At the time, this part of Mars was likely underwater. About 17 million years ago, according to radiometric dating techniques, Allen Hill's 84001 was blasted off the surface of Mars by a meteorite impact and drifted about the inner solar system until about 15,000 years ago, it fell to Earth. Okay, such is the tale of many meteorites found around the world. Uh, what's special about Allen Hill's in a nutshell is that it just ever so possibly might contain fossils. The evidence is very ambiguous and is open to interpretation and most people don't think it's true anymore, but in 1996, uh, David McKay from NASA published an article in Science suggesting that certain very microscopic features, 20 to 100 nanometers in diameter, resemble bacteria. Um, I've got my 
my, here we go. I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, like this right here is an example of one of them uh, and could represent the first evidence of extraterrestrial life. This was taken seriously enough at the time that President Clinton uh, uh, announced it publicly. Uh, it seems clear that these structures are not earthly bacterial contamination, which has been found in some meteorites and produces different structures. What is debatable, however, is whether these structures were ever biological in nature at all, uh, or whether they were produced on Mars by purely chemical means. Since I tend not to be a romantic, I suspect that Alan Hills is a false alarm. Nevertheless, uh, you know, Alan Hills just maybe could represent a kind of prehistoric Martian version of Sharknado, uh, a life form carried through space on the wings of literally a meteorological phenomena. Um, it's an interesting way to end things. We'll finish with a quote from the early 20th century astronomer Harlow Shapley, who despite being a glory hog and coming perilously close to a plagiarist uh, with regard to Henrietta Leavitt, uh, did some very important work and wrote an entertaining book called Beyond the Observatory, which I had when I was growing up. He wrote something in the book uh, more appropriate to tonight's topic than I would have believed existed, uh, except that I read it when I was a kid. And I used this quote eventually in my high school yearbook, which is what you see here. There's nothing like us except perhaps in the dazzling instincts of birds and bugs. Uh, so thank you all. And if any of you have any questions, I probably can't answer them, but please feel free to ask. I'm going to. Okay, great. Uh, uh, interesting and uh, different uh, presentation, John. Uh, anybody have any uh, questions for John? Uh, I can use the uh, I do chat. have a question. Okay. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Yeah, um, John, um, uh, thank you. This is very interesting. I, I have a question about the, um, the animals that use the magnetic field. Um, uh, it's uh, any kind of speculation or hypothesis of how, um, you know, periodically the Earth's poles flip, uh, how that would affect it? I don't know if I, I, I can only, the only answer I can give is that given that they've continued doing this for, for you know, and that happens every every uh how often it's like it's 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 not infrequent right that the, the, the magnetic pulse right. flip it's a hundred thousand years or something like yeah. that my yeah. a lot of these species have been around that long and my guess is that they are really just following the force lines and not really interested in what direction they're facing mm -hmm. you know so so that's that's the, you know that's not based on any scientific uh, uh information i have but that's just my thought okay thank you very much I guess I mean it's it's supposed to be sort of on the verge of happening now, right? So so uh, maybe we'll get to find out if we suddenly see birds flying, you know, flying north uh, in the winter. You know, um, we'll know why. I hope not. Oh, I hope right. not. Right. <laughs> okay. Any other questions uh, for John about animal astronomers? Okay. No? Okay. Well, uh, thanks for the a very uh, interest, different and interesting uh, presentation there, John. Uh, thanks for, for being here tonight. Uh, so uh, uh, well, thanks for that. Uh, for uh, members of NJAG, please uh, stick around. We're going to be, be doing our uh, business meeting. We've got a couple of things to uh, take care of. Uh, but um, for those of you who are uh, guests, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we will be um, having our next meeting uh, in January, the second to Wednesday in January. The, name, the uh, date escapes me at the moment, but uh, uh, be the second uh, Jan uh, uh, meeting, uh, second month, sorry, second week in, in January will be our next uh, the meeting, the first meeting of the year. And uh, at that point uh, for the program for that night will be uh, a, will be actually be having that uh, in person uh, at Montclair State. Uh, we'll be doing a introduction to the nighttime sky and just showing people kind of doing a refresher course for some of our members on how to use the telescopes uh, at Montclair State. And so we'll be doing that and uh, others are welcome to join us at that point.
Uh, so uh, check out our website, njastro.org, or look at uh, look us up on Facebook, NJG. Uh, this presentation and others are also on our YouTube uh, channel. So check out NJG online on uh, YouTube, and uh, uh, we'll see you in the new year. So thanks for joining us. Should I?